Sometimes you forget how long the load times can be on this whole thing. But I mean, they did their best. But we're continuing our little journey on the Chozo Ruins. And we're mostly back in sequence at this point, other than the Space Jump Boots still existing. But other than that, we're following what's supposed to be going on. I just have a little bit of extra mobility that I'm supposed to have. No big deal. But yeah, we're continuing the Chozo Ruins one power up at a time type of progression. It's just how the game works at this point. It's not really expecting you to do much. For some reason, I always thought that this next power-up is something you had to use the charge beam for, but... I mean, missiles work just fine. I don't know why my memory keeps trying to say that that's the charge beam. I mean, I have an idea, and it's coming up in a bit. But anyways... You can just grab that one. That is one of those power-ups that you can find either with a certain power-up later, or just by listening to it. Because it'll make that distinct... And, you know, if you've caught on to that being the power-up noise... You might think to shoot the wall. It also looks kind of cracked, but that's that's about it. Unlike many other things, you can't just scan it. So here we have a gimmick for this room. There's four different red scans throughout it, and you have to find them all. They can be under things, they could be like, you have to destroy some crates for them, or just up against a wall. So keep an eye out, and they will be in one of several locations. I mean, they're in the same place every time, but you have to check top and bottom. So, for example, we have three of them now, but we still need the fourth. And the fourth's just right there, so grab them all without having to jump down or anything. They do light up which ones you've already found, so, I mean, if you're ever wondering how many you have, just look at the glowing symbols around the circle there. But this gets us our next power-up and a little bit of Chozo or Glower, if you want to go ahead and scan that past me. I'll go ahead and read these at some point, but I'm going to make it its own thing, just because that makes more sense rather than stopping gameplay every couple of minutes to read story. But yeah! This is why I thought that wall requires a charge beam, because it's just outside the charge beam room! So my assumption was that, oh hey, maybe it's like at the beginning when you used your charge, be uh, your charge beam on debris, but no. The charge beam does work on these guys, though! Now, the charge beam is kind of weird in this game in terms of its damage. You can see a big charging meter start coming up in the center there, showing how much you've actually charged. But it does the exact same damage from the start of the charging animation to the end of it. So as long as the charge beam has at least just begun its charge, just fire it off, it'll do the same thing. There's something later on that requires you to charge all the way, but for its current purpose, it doesn't matter whether it's a big glowing ball or just a little tiny ball at the end of the cannon. It does the same damage, save everything else. Blows up all the same enemies that needed the charge beam for it. Just go ahead and fire it. That's one of those things where you're not really going to know that, because I don't think it explicitly mentions it anywhere in the game. Just figure it out by experimenting with it, and most people probably don't realize that. So yeah, pro tip for the charge beam. It requires a lot less charge than it used to. <laughs> but either way, uh, that is actually a completely optional power-up. You don't even have to go that way at all. Instead, you're supposed to come up here. I mean, there's an elaborate series of morph ball tunnels you can do to get up here without the space jump that we have. <laughs> I forgot that! <laughs> so, uh, Samus likes to move, like, really quick sometimes. <laughs> I didn't press down very much, but she went flying back. And once you're in midair, uh, you actually have surprisingly little control over Samus if you fall off a cliff. If you jump, you have a lot more control over your jump. But if you just fall off a cliff, you are going down like a rock. <laughs> and that was a perfect example. <laughs> oh, it never changed past me. <laughs> so the type of wall that we have there is one that I couldn't actually access at the moment. So we'll get to that. But for now, we have a little bit more to do in this employees in this room. Oh, hey, energy pickups. So all the different pickups in the game are scans as well, so just make sure to grab those. I know I already got the small energy and the missile door, and this! This is one of those limited ones that you can easily miss. There are very few doors in the game that have that particular type of lock, so make sure to grab one of the, the very few. That's the first one that you can get, but there's another one that's really easy to grab in one of the later worlds. And here we have yet another enemy. Vulnerable only from within, so the first page lets you know everything you need to know about the Stone Toad. It's kind of cute, actually. <laughs> Just his beady little eyes poking around. <laughs> Alright, 
since we're going for another major power up rather than the optional one of the charge beam, it is time for yet another mini boss. Will our mini boss sign in, please? Here we have, as the scan will show, the incinerator drone. This thing, it's really not that difficult, but if you're trying to avoid taking damage entirely, well, it can be a little tricky because this fight gets somewhat busy. All because we have yet another form of War Wasp. This is another one-time scan, so make sure to scan these, they don't turn up anywhere else. The only difference between them and regular War Wasps is that they have a big bulbous butt that stores toxins to shoot at you. That's really about it. So yeah, you have the ramming variety, you have the other ramming variety, and you have the one that shoots projectiles. It's an interesting defense mechanism to just like... I, I can't help but wonder, did the Chosa just make this very war, war Wasp friendly and program the Incinerator Drone to do this? Or does the Incinerator Drone have a little bit of, you know, a little bit of AI in it to actually realize that there are War Wasps above it that it could irritate with its flames? This is one of those things where, where yet again, try not to apply too much logic to video games, but did the ch where's the chicken and which one's the egg? I don't know. I don't know how it exactly got into this situation, but we're playing jump rope with fire and losing terribly. It's fine. This thing goes down really easily. Charge just... Charge three more missiles, either will do the trick. And for all this fire and expl- well, not explosives, but for all this fire, we get... Small explosives. The Morph Ball Bomb has been re-unlocked. Now we can blow up all those different things that are made of sandstone that we've been seeing in various scans. But the first thing to do is actually in the room itself. This little wall right here. It even tries to guide you this way with the morph ball catching rails there. I always like when they're just the right size that your morph ball kind of settles into the groove and kind of follows along it. It's one of those things where, I don't know, it's just kind of neat. Little details on the ground that they didn't have to put there, but they did! It makes it look nice. It even has a small gameplay impact. Yes, there's even loading zones in the warp ball tunnels as well! You don't see those doors very often, because usually the game's kind of ahead of you when it comes to warp ball tunnels, but occasionally you'll get through them slightly faster. But yeah, vulnerable only from within, which translates to get yourself eaten and then blow up the stone toad with a bomb from the inside, as way too many shows have done in the past. So yeah! And now that we have the Morphball Bomb, we're able to scan the Morphball Bomb slots, which can be activated with the bomb because, well, Retro interpret them as small bursts of electricity, so it ends up powering the slot. Once again, these Chozos don't really come from anywhere that had anything to do with Sama's suit, so for this to conveniently work is another confusion, but <laughs> look, the Metroid game is a <laughs> Metroid has a lot of things related to plot that are full of holes, so try not to worry about it too much. But I just, I just can't help it. <laughs> I can't help it, there's just so many things. Either way, this is meant to be like a time piece switchy type of puzzle. You don't really have much indication of how long you have. You can hear the butter, 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 and that will gradually get faster, but... It's for so much longer of a duration that it makes you start to wonder how long you have. Of course, you can always get up here without the space jump. All you have to do is go slightly more around and board the platforms from the higher raised portions rather than the very bottom. But this works too. We got the convenience of the space jump, may as well use it. So if you didn't scan that door before finishing this puzzle, then that scan is no longer available. There are other chances to get that particular type of door shield, but not that one for now. So. If we still have the hint system on and we're in sequence, this would be telling us to go take a look at energy spikes coming from the furnace. So the furnace is where we're headed. As you can notice by the slight graphical change of these tunnels to have a bit more of a heated, fiery look to them. It's really neat how the two different, like, big sections of the Chozo ruins have distinct dividers like that. Unfortunately, due to the power-ups required, we won't actually get to see the vast majority of this section until much later. But we get to go into the middle of the charred, broken down furnace and grab an energy tank from it at least. <laughs> kind of took a cool texturing work. It may not look as good as it used to, but I mean, it still looks pretty good. Especially coming from a GameCube for heaven's sakes. Yeah. Get our second energy tank of the game. 
They really want you to pick these things up for reasons that would become apparent before too much longer. As the game struggles to load a little bit. It's just some treat backs game, you'll be okay. Now another really nice thing about Metroid Prime, there's a lot of just good design decisions to handle the backtracking. There are exceptions, of course, like I've already covered. But a little morph ball tunnel, really nice. It gets you more accustomed to the morph ball bombs. It gives you an option if you hadn't found the morph ball bomb tunnel in the boss room itself, because it has the same sort of texturing. Has you look out for those types of little tunnel covers. And yeah, now that we have the bombs, we can acquire this. I think past me had another thing to demonstrate with this particular missile expansion as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So. Those of you who are familiar with the Metroid series may know about bomb jumping. The sequence of placing morph ball bombs just so that you can get a little bit of extra height from them and explore higher places. This is an example of just doing a morph ball bomb jump. These are actually expected by Retro, the designers of this here video game, as there are multiple times where you need to actually perform this technique to get a power up. They're never, like, mandatory power ups, they're always things like missile expansions or energy tanks or whatnot. But it's neat that they actually expect you to learn that. You can always get up there later with the space jump, but the fact that it is set up to be bomb jumpable, I don't know if it's on purpose, but it's appreciated. It's just a cool little spot to teach that one. The timing's actually really not bad on Metroid Prime at all, and you've only got access to three bombs, so that's the highest you can get from bomb jumping. Well, yeah, it does the trick. I can only imagine how broken this game would be if you could bomb jump forever, like you can in some of the 2D titles like Super Metroid. Bomb jumping's usually not the most exciting thing to watch, because in all the iterations it has been extremely slow. But it's a concept that has existed from the very first Metroid game. It was slightly different in terms of how it worked, since instead it was bombing yourself to get you a little extra hype before doing a regular jump in midair, because that worked for some reason. But it kind of evolved from there. And yeah, now we're finally climbing up this big tree room, and there are more runic symbols for us to access. And here's a different type of these types of weeds. Those don't stick around forever, so do make sure to scan them. I want to say there's one more place in the game they show up even after you finish the portion of Chosa Ruins that makes them go away. Well, slipping and falling is the theme of this particular video, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, pass me. This is an example of the type of klutziness that you don't get to see in the no damage runs. Because they get edited out, and I just do whole new runs. <laughs> Unless I keep out tags like with Mario Sunshine, then you get to see all the glorious mistakes. <laughs> but this time, it's just regular old mistakes. You could just warp ball and use the bombs through those tunnels like you're supposed to, and it would have saved me a lot of time, considering I fell down twice. But the neat little jump mechanics and weird abuse of how momentum gets carried over when you're doing space jumps and whatnot, I just like to do them. It's like once I figured out that that actually extends your jump range, I just tried to have a lot of fun with it, because... I mean, I've played this game a bunch of times, but I've only really broken it for the space jump a couple of times. Yeah, you activate the four Rudic symbols. This is to make sure you at least fight the Incinerator Drone before moving on. Make sure you have a missile as well! The game's very insistent that you come adequately prepared, although you can come without the furnace energy tank if you really feel like it. It's not a bad idea, it's probably a lot faster to avoid that one and get it later, when you come back with the power-up to do the rest of the furnace area. But for now, we have a bunch of these things to deal with, as we reach... A loading zone of particularly long loading! This guy! Oh, emulation never changed. But anyways, we've reached the first actual boss of the game. The intro of Parasite Queen doesn't really count. All these other mini-bosses don't count. This is the first major boss. What's the difference between all those mini-bosses and the major boss? Well, this one will take a lot longer to kill. It actually has, you know, some significant danger to it. But welcome to Flakra. <laughs> And make sure to scan Flogger's tentacles, because there they are, a separate entry! And it's one of the things that I missed the first time I tried to get 100% scans in this video game. Good lord, was I ever displeased to find out they had their own unique 
Research log entry. But the point of this, after the initial cutscene, to show you that, oh hey, this satellite dish flipped down on his, you know, making the boss grow. You have to shoot the satellite dish to make it flip back up, so that way light is not reflecting in flagra, and they fall over stunned, because they can't hold their weight up anymore because they're not receiving enough nutrients from the sun! So here's a couple more. This is a fairly predictable escalation of boss. You can see four satellite dishes, so I mean it stands to reason that we reason reason that we'll be doing this four times. So one thing you can do to flag run is if you shoot it enough, it will be stunned for a significant length of time, allowing you to side jump all the way around the room. This is definitely the more ideal way to fight Flagra, because if you stay locked onto the boss itself, then you actually keep your aim in just the perfect place to shoot the satellite dishes as well. You can lock onto them separately, but the problem is, you can't get to them as quickly. If you stay locked onto Flagra, you can just do the side hop the entire time, and that just allows you to get around the arena more quickly, keeps your aim on Flagra for whenever it gets unstunned, so you can knock it out again. I think a lot of people have trouble with this boss because they get too caught up on the satellite dishes instead of actually stunning the boss. Because yeah, it's like, I can get two of these down, because if you don't leave Flagra stunned, then it will actually flip the satellite dishes back down with its big, you know, scythe-like claws. And this can get really tedious and annoying if you don't know how to manage its stun. So yeah, this uh, this boss can actually give new players a lot of trouble just because they don't think to go ahead and keep shooting the boss enough, and also don't stay locked on to be able to do the side hops around and put the satellite panels again. This is kind of like an accumulation of a whole bunch of different combat strategies found throughout the shows of Ruins. It's actually super neat. You learn about the side hop from the Blade of Beetle, you learn like use all your power ups, the charge shot, the missiles, and the, the more fall bombs, everything else. And the charge beam really allows you to knock the satellite dishes right back up. So it kind of just combines everything together for you to have a neat little boss experience. Fiber is definitely not difficult once you catch on to these couple of things, but yeah, the first time it can be pretty rough. Also, hilariously, there are times where Flagra will get stunned and end up falling directly on top of you, which does hurt. You can also hurt yourself by like, just by steering into the scythe claws of the down Flagra as well, so... Basically, don't ram yourself into space in two pointy objects. But either way, with the four uh, satellite dish generation done, that's the end of the first boss. The venoms and poisons purge from its body. As it gives a few last shriveling growths throughout the land. This effect has always looked kind of weird. But either way, getting rid of the poison at the root very, very quickly gets rid of the poison throughout the Chozo ruins. You know, it's a shame that these Chozo were an off branch, their own little rogue group. Because all they need now was one little power suit to deal with the problem the whole time. Oh well, they're lost. As we get. Power up that is just a the symbol for for Samus' suit. A various suit as we gain the almighty shoulders of Samus around, and what many would believe is either storage space or just little cooling systems in those shoulders. <laughs> One of the two. I mean, you gotta put all those missiles somewhere, right? Well, we're already back up to the various suits, so Samus' time in the power suit is short as usual. And you can't really go back the way you came, so now we get to proceed from the back door, Flarba. Spoilers, you actually will be back in this area later on, there's not really much choice of it. But the thing that you can get here, even having the space jump, you can't get it at this time. I have tried. It just doesn't work. Still haven't scanned a missile pickup. We'll get it eventually. I'll remember. <laughs> but yeah, there's an ultra energy power up as well. You only see those at very particular times, but they give you 100 energy. And these guys that we currently cannot deal with. The charge beam sucks them towards you, and yeah, they'll crash into your face and do a bunch of damage and cause a bunch of static on your visor, so not fun. If you try to very carefully peer down here, sometimes you can sneak a scan off on an enemy, but. Geronimo! Yeah, you won't be able to get back up that way for quite some time, and 
that would be how you get back to Flagler's place, since the front door has been all sealed up. More lore to look at at a later date. And more specifically, I mentioned the word cordite. There's an example of something that's locked behind cordite. We'll figure out what that is for later on, as well as the nice little tracks on the walls. But for now, you'd think I'd want to go to that elevator, but nah. There's a couple more things to do in the ruins, so we might as well clean those up right now. It's not really all that much, but there's some power-ups I really like to grab before heading on to the next area. It's like, I could, but I just want to get this one done real quick. It's just a convenient time to come do it. Because you're not going to be in this area of the Chozo ruins again for a long time, so I might as well do it now. It's a helpful thing. First off, there is a missile expansion in this very big vault. I'm actually surprised they put something so worthless in there, but I mean, I'm not going to question the bird people. <laughs> they made this suit after all, not this branch, but one of them did. As we get to this game's tutorial for bomb jumping! And hey, it's in the days where things don't explicitly tell you what to do. Because this is for something completely optional, but you have to learn bomb jumping if you're going to be able to get up to that top slot. Space jumping and morph falling does not work, just because the animation for morph falling is so long that it's not like in 2D games where you can pull off that nonsense. But if you figure out how to bomb jump, then this one's no problem. There's not really any hints other than the fact that there's no, like, something that you have to blow up on that top, uh, bomb switch. Yeah. So they try to teach you how to do that pretty quickly. It is an important skill for a number of power-ups, so makes sense. Some of them are energy tanks, so you do actually want to be able to grab those, since there's not as many tanks in this game as others. Speaking of... Go ahead and add that to the total. And the other thing to do real quick is to get the power-ups that we saw the heading for the Ram War Boss mini-boss. That'll require the Morph Ball Bombs, so we can get all those now, too. These guys are less of a problem than they used to be with the power of the Charge Beam. Although you can still just stun them. They do still hurt you when their eyes are closed. You bonk into them. So yeah, ramming your face into things, not the best of strategies in this game. It's not like others where you do contact damage too. Yeah, it's a very simple sandstone block based warp bomb puzzle right here. All you gotta do is make sure to destroy that one block before coming into the main entrance of the maze right here. Well, maze, quote unquote, the passageway. You actually can use the scan visor to figure out what those blocks are made out of. It answers sandstone, which of course is the Morphal Bombs. And get another missile expansion. Like in any other Metroid game, we're gonna have way too many missiles than we know what to do with. But that's good enough for now. Continuing on will lead to the next area, which will be for next time. And while that will do it, the first boss is down, and next time we'll be heading out to a brand new area of, of Talon 4. See ya!